really wonderful scripture passage today. And Swamiji has drawn out of it the lesson of meditation, but I want to draw of it at least first the lesson of time. Uh, because time is such an extraordinarily complicated and interesting element in the experiences of our lives. Interestingly, um, the song that they were singing earlier comes from the, the children's book, and the children's book is called The Time Tunnel. And the whole um, story about it is two young children um, who find a, a destroyed laboratory that leads them through a dark passage, which turns out to be a time tunnel. And then the fun of the book is that they can go backwards and forwards in time. <clears throat> and as Swamiji said, the fun of writing fiction is that you can just say whatever you want. You don't have to justify it. So he takes them to Atlantis and to ancient Egypt and to, into the future. And of course, it's all based on, on a, what he believes is, is a true understanding of those civilizations. But he can just put it out there without having to footnote anything. So it's a very entertaining book. And also what he had to do, because he was talking about time travel, which is something that has fascinated philosophers and scientists forever. And yogis in India have demonstrated some remarkable examples. Excuse me, I have something in my throat. <clears throat> yogis in India have demonstrated a remarkable ability to transcend the um, so-called barriers of time. Years ago in the uh, late 50s, in 1958 and 59, when Swami Kriyananda first went to India, he was a, uh, in his mid-30s at the time, um, Indian friends took him to see a pundit who had what was called the Book of Brigu. Brigu was an, uh, an ancient sage, lived some thousands and thousands of years ago. Nobody really knows exactly when he lived. He's referred to in the Bhagavad Gita. When Krishna is trying to talk about how the Lord is in everything, and he mentions the greatest aspect of many dimensions, and he says, he says, of sages, I was Brigu. So Brigu is sort of lauded to be one of the greatest sages in all of spiritual history in India. So the book of Brigu is actually not a book in the way we think of finding something between two covers or on a Kindle or something like that. Um, rather, it's, a, it's a, 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 a manuscript that's written on leaves or on parchment, you know, some sort of ancient, and it's been copied over a couple of times, and, the, and it's piles of loose sheets that are wrapped in cloth, and it's distributed in many different locations over Indu, India. Many people have parts of the Book of Brigu. And what the Book of Brigu is, and who knows why or how it was created, is the sage Brigu and perhaps some of his disciples wrote specific uh, predictions and descriptions of people who would live thousands of years in the future. And what they were then at that time, what they had been in their past lives, something about what they would be in their future lives. And when you go to a pundit who has a piece of the book of Brigu, he casts a horoscope either for your birth or for the moment that you come, I'm not sure which. And then by what Swami described as a complicated system that was completely unclear to him, they go ferret around in their shelves of these books and bring out certain bundles and start looking for a horoscope, a, a pattern that matches the one that they just cast. And if they find one, then you have a reading. And not everybody has something in the book of Brigu. And then just to make it worse, lest we all run over to India, now that there's so many Westerners coming, there's a lot of fake books of Brigu, so just forget it on a practical level. But Swami Kriyananda was there, and they found a page for him. And later, actually, they allowed him to borrow the page, and he had it tested, you know, and it was, it was old, not as old as Brigu is supposed to be, but they said that these things have been, has been recopied. And it described, it described him by name. The name Kriyananda is a very unusual name. They described his father's profession. They described that he would be born outside of the United States. They described that he would have two brothers, but they actually said, but no living sister is possible, which was an, uh, an obscure remark to him. When he went back to America, he asked his mother, and she had had a miscarriage. He never knew that she'd had a miscarriage. It would be impossible to know whether the child had been a female, 
but it was just a, a small fact. They knew what his American name was. Kriyananda's English name is James Donald Walters, but he was always called Donald, but they knew his name was James. They, the book of Brigu, knew his name is James. He said nobody else in India, as far as he knew, knew that his name was James. And those are just some of the details. Swami has actually written a slim volume called the book of Brigu, which is very interesting. And, uh, and then he talked about who his guru would be, um, Yogananda. He talked about circumstances of his lives. Then he talked about some past lives and some future lives with, with enough facts um, that, that it all seemed to fit together. Swami then wrote up about the book of Brigu primarily to awaken people to the, to the idea that this world is not what it seems, that there's a lot going on here that we don't know about. Even more recently, Swamiji was treated to another reading by another sage. This sage is Saint Agastya, who is also a very ancient sage, who apparently there's the, of the book of, of Agastya, which is around too. And someone uh, presented him with his page out of that book, which was also um, startlingly accurate. I mean, you just meet total strangers and they pull this ancient piece of parchment off the shelf and they start telling you about yourself. A big piece of you says, how can this be done? You look for parlor tricks, you look for hypnosis, um, you look for just sheer fraud, but you can't actually figure out how. Swamiji tells another story about the book of Brigu that a group, a uh, friend of his, I mean, somebody he knows personally, whose integrity he knows in India, went to, was going to visit a pundit, a Brigu pundit, and he was in a train compartment going down to wherever the place was. I think they were going to the south. They were all in the compartment together. They went to the city. The people dispersed. They were strangers. And then when he went to have his reading, everybody who'd been in the train compartment was there at the Book of Brigu at the same time. And the reading said... I've gathered some of my old friends together for this reading. And then the reading said, now there will be a thunderclap. And he said it was a completely clear sky and there was a roll of thunder. I, I mean, it, part of you just wants to just sit down and wait to, for your life to happen. Why should I lift a finger, you know, if it's all as inevitable as that? Like... I don't exactly know where to put any of this. When Swamiji, now coming back to the time tunnel, he's, he's having to explain, because this is a, a youth fiction book, so he's taken very complicated philosophical ideas and reduced them to levels that I can understand. It's been wonderful. I've suggested that Swami write a whole library of youth books on all the philosophical subjects, because then maybe we can get it. You know, because these ideas, I've heard Swamiji talk about time. He, he, he became inspired once years ago with this image of time that started with this bare planet. He was trying to get us to understand the relationship between time and movement. And if there's nothing moving, then there's no time. And he was so excited about this idea. I must have heard him 25 times talk about this bare, unmoving planet with nothing happening on it, and then he would explain, and each time I would say, yes, today I will understand. And I would just, total blank. And still, to this day, every time he starts talking about that barren planet, I just like, oh no, here we go again. But in the time tunnel, he drew this picture. And the picture was this. He said, we tend to think of time as linear, because that's how we experience it, isn't it? I used to be a little kid. And then I sort of progressed like this, you know, like moving forward in a long line. And now I'm a big kid and now I'm an old lady. And all of these things happen and they certainly seem to be behind us, in front of us, and somewhere in the middle. And, and each thing happens and once it happens, the other is gone. I remember my father, and this was a very wistful moment when he realized that I was, you know, on my own. He, he said, the child disappears into the adult which uh, we all see happen. You know, you, all children are beautiful, but with all due respect, not all grown-ups are beautiful. Something happens somewhere in the middle there, and children are sweet and innocent, and not all of the rest of us are sweet and innocent. And <clears throat> parents have a certain relationship to their little ones that just, it disappears. I mean, so many things seem to disappear, don't they? But then, where did they go? And were they ever really there? 
So Swamiji, trying to explain how time is, he talks about time is not linear, it's circular. Reality is circular, time is circular. And we live in the now, which is right in the center. And when the more deeply we center ourselves into the present moment, without all of this identification with the past and anticipation about the future, the more we can be right where we are. Isn't that the biggest challenge of life all the time? How many of us have had experiences that we didn't really notice? You're driving down the road and then suddenly you're where you were going, but you hoped you had your eyes open in between, right? Or you're, you're in a situation, but you're not really there because your mind is running with the things that happened yesterday that may happen tomorrow that you hope you're going to do this. I mean, the whole art of meditation is just trying to make all that stop and just be here now. That was that wonderful book written decades ago that got many people on the spiritual path, Be Here Now. Richard Alpert, uh, Baba Ramdas wrote that. And he wrote a book later called Still Here. <laughs> <laughs> after he'd gone through many trials and many things that happened, well, I'm still here. So Swamiji talks about the whole art. We stand in the now, and when we have stopped identifying with the past, stopped anticipating the future, we realize that it's all simultaneously present. Because also, and um, uh, let me think how to say this. Oh, someone, someone gave me this phrase which helped also understand that um, your karma, all of your karma is always standing right next to you. It's always all present. Now what that's about is we think of our lives again because our perception is limited. We see our lives in the unit that we can grasp. When I was first uh, uh, learning from Swami Kriyananda, sometimes he would do things that I didn't like or I didn't understand or just seemed like why would he behave that way? I realized that he was the source of my understanding of right and wrong, and therefore if he violated it, it might be some mistake on my part. But in any case, he would do things that I couldn't understand. And always, I found that what he did was perfectly comprehensible if I looked at it from his point of view. And I began to realize that my view was like a, a television screen that's about this big. And I became conscious of things when they entered that square. You know, something would enter that square, and I would see a certain cause and effect like this, and then people would go off the square, and that would be my sense of reality. Swami's perspective was, I don't know if there's any edges to his screen, but he was way back here. So when something would enter my screen, it had already been going on for a really long time. And his response would often would be based on, you know, an intuitive understanding of cause and effect, realities, what was needed that was not was simply imperceptible to me. And it caused me to be very respectful and not so quick to say yes or no to whatever was happening. Now all of us can appreciate how completely interwoven things are and it's very, very difficult to sort of wait, say where something starts or end. A Buddhist woman teacher um, was talking once about how she'd accepted many aspects of that teaching but she had trouble with the law of karma because we have trouble thinking that we're not in charge. And we also have a lot of trouble feeling that we're just on a train, on a track. We want to feel like we have more control than that. So we sort of take our ego and try to pull it out of that system. And she talked about the fact that she was holding her little grandchild and the grandchild sneezed in her face. And like as often happens, she got the disease that her little grandchild had and then she had a cold and because she was ill, that had certain consequences and this whole thing started going along. And she started thinking about, well, how does karma fit into this? But she started thinking about for her to be able to hold her grandchild, well, she had to at least, she had to have a grandchild. And of course, to have a grandchild, she'd had to have a child, right? And then for that child to have a baby himself, that child had to have a spouse. So that meant that somebody else had to have a child. And well, like for her to have a child, first she had to have a husband. And for her to have a husband, well, she had to have been in a certain place to meet the husband, didn't she? And in order to be in that place, you know, and then pretty soon you're back to Adam and Eve. And, and you just don't know where you could cut out any section of that. 
and have it stand independently. And so the course of our lives, if we could read it, you see, is this inevitable, certain, at a certain level inevitable, movement of energy where one pl force plays into another, plays into another. And the reason we can't see it <clears throat> is because we're so identified with what's happening now, or sort of now, you know, that our minds, our, our perception is simply limited. I mean, even just think of it, it's very helpful sometimes when you have an idea that's so huge, such as, well, we could be so identified with the now that we could remember all our past lives. Part of us just, you just don't know how to go there. So Swamiji has always been very good about taking huge ideas and putting them down to little things that we've already experienced. You know, isn't it so that even in the present, if we become very deeply identified and involved in some small aspect of our lives, often we lose track of others or we become aware of it. We can be so involved, say, in, in trying to fix someone's life situation or helping someone in a certain way that we're just, we just lose track of how our actions are affecting other people because we're so identified with one thing that our, our awareness of other realities is blocked. So if it can happen in any dimension, you can see how you could extrapolate from that. I'm so involved right now in the experiences of this incarnation that all of the experiences from some previous incarnation, I just can't remember them, even though they made me exactly who I am, that I wouldn't be standing here right now, not only if my father hadn't been stationed in Key West, Florida, and happened to meet my mother in Florida, my father was in, the, and my father would not have been in Key West if he hadn't been drafted into the army from New York City, and that wouldn't have happened if there hadn't been a war in Europe, and so it all goes back to Hitler, you know. All of these different things happen, so my father meets my mother in Key West, and then I'm standing here, but why did I choose when the sperm and ovum united and that flash of light went into the astral world, why did I jump into that womb? You know, well, because there was something about the vibration that related to me. I mean, there you go. Don't you? But you see, why was I in tune with that particular vibration? Well, because of all the things that happened in the past that made me a certain way. But I can't remember any of them. All I can feel is the now. But you see, everything that exists has to be included in this moment. And therefore, if our awareness was broad enough, we would be able to know it all. And we would be able to know it all in detail. Now, even though this is really interesting, how does that relate to what we're talking about today? Because you see, the single enduring fact of our lives that we're really trying to know is that we, have, we are not now and never have been separate from the eternal bliss of our own nature. Now that's something really worth knowing, isn't it? We have never been separated from that. And we are now in the presence of God. I am now and forever will be and always have entirely one with the divine spirit. And all we have to do, as Master says so encouragingly, is improve our knowing. But you see how very different an idea that is? That the only difficulty is my awareness, not my nature? And we have become so confused that when all of these temporary things happen to us, we slip over and begin to identify with that so strongly that we, we think, well, now I have to go through this. Now I have to process this. Now I have to get over this. Now I have to, have to do it anyway and anyway. And so we move out of the presence of God into all these things, and we very steadily work our way through them. Now, just because we are now and forever shall be one with the eternal bliss of our own nature doesn't mean that you can just say, well, I guess that makes me God, doesn't it? Master was so um, delighted by a teacher in the 40s when he was in New York. There was some uh, self-proclaimed spiritual leader and he had a big chair like a throne and across it he had a title and it said, God. 
And he would just sit in that chair, you know, and I don't know who followed him, but I guess enough did that Master knew about him. Master just found it just delightful, delightfully ridiculous, you know. Now, because the other factor that relates to our sort of entrapment is the only way I can think about it, and it's about karma. Karma is cause and effect. We, we, we do certain actions, they have certain results. It's a whole long discussion in itself, which I can just touch on like that. But the karma that we carry from lifetime to lifetime is no thing. It's not like we have the money that we stole, you know, and are going to have to someday pay back or anything like that. There's no physical thing. It remains in the spine as impressions of energy. But energy gathered in movement creates magnetism. And magnetism has an attracting force or repelling force. This energy world attracts and repels. And energy that builds up has a, a certain power. And if we've put out a lot of energy in a certain direction, in order to shift the direction of that energy, we have to match the, the force. It's like that. That's why Swamiji talks about when karma comes, when we're hit by some karmic wave of whatever it might be, the phrase he uses is, meet it at the crest. You know, if a wave of karma comes at you like this, what happens is a wave will crest, and then time itself will gradually cause that wave to diminish. And sometimes a karmic wave comes, and we just hunker down. We just hang in there. And then if we wait long enough, finally the wave is the same size we are, and we say, oh, I've overcome it. Well, we have. We've overcome it. We've overcome that much of its energy. We've simply outlasted it. He said, but when a challenge comes to us, if we can expand our energy and our consciousness to be as big as the wave and meet that wave of karma at the crest, then we can really make progress. So the reason it takes us so much time to sort of reverse these misunderstandings is because of the energy we put out. You know, as much energy as we put out, to that energy, we f to that extent, we free ourselves of those karmic patterns which are holding us. It's just a, it's a, it's metaphysics. That's what metaphysics is. It's the, it's the, the natural laws that govern this shifting of consciousness. So um, when we are seeking now this uh, to free ourselves from this absolutely exhausting round of being happy for a while and then sad and then sad for a long time and then happy and then happy for a little while and then sad again and then things are okay and then something changes, you know, it just, um, well, the words Master used was anguishing monotony of the whole thing. It's not really, and I love that word, it's not really like it's ugly, it's just tiresome. I, I was remembering a friend of mine who has five daughters, and when they were potty training the fifth daughter, and everybody was celebrating the success of the little baby and using the potty, the father was celebrating the success of the baby, and then he turned to his wife and he said, are we here again? <laughs> you know, and sometimes you just feel like that, don't you? Just here we are again. You know, here I am as a child, here I am as a teenager, here I am as a grown man, and everything is good, but where is the eternal bliss? You know, if we really want to feel it, and then when really tough things come to us, you know, it's more than a casual question, where is the eternal bliss? Where did it go? How did I lose it? You know, but it's all just a question of energy. It's all just a question of every day putting out the very best that we can to meet whatever comes to us with the very best that we can give it. And and deeply understanding, this is what I was going from a moment ago, deeply understanding that there's nothing ever that keeps us from that experience except our own perception, which is to say, we are not wrong, we are not evil, we are not bad, we are not unforgiven, you know, we are not exiled, we are not cursed, none of these things. We are in the presence of God and all we have to do is say, it really doesn't matter what I've done, it really doesn't matter anything that's happened. If I meet whatever challenge there is to my awareness of God with an absolute conviction that this is my divine right to that extent, we will be able to experience it. You see, it's a, it, the spiritual path is very interesting 
because it's not easy. We've spent a really long time building up delusion. I, I say to people, you should have a lot of respect for your delusions. You spend a long time developing them. You can't just, when people say to me, oh, I feel this way and I know it's stupid. I say, no, it's not stupid at all. It's extremely complex and, and cunning. You know, you can't just dismiss it that way. And one shouldn't even dismiss oneself that way. Oh, this problem is dumb. Oh, this problem is silly. No, 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 no. Have a tremendous respect for the confusion that we've gotten ourselves into. It's a very, very formidable enemy. And we have to treat it, in a very odd way, we have to treat it with dignity. We have to see, look, this is something I really have to work on. But it's only energy, it's not me. It's only a mistaken sense of self, it's not me. So no matter how big and glorious, and, and, and I say we can't dismiss it as stupid, because then we don't deal with it in the proper way. We have to, as I say, we have to recognize it as a really formidable foe. But that doesn't mean that God isn't greater. That doesn't mean that no matter how powerful and how long we've been in that, Master has a, 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 a magnificent image which we should meditate on every day. A room can be in total darkness for millions of years, and as soon as you bring the light into it, the darkness disappears because it never had any reality. Its only reality is the absence of light. And every delusion, every suffering, every even just little sort of variation from eternal bliss that we experience is just a shadow creeping in. It has no more substance than a shadow. It's just a shadow creeping in. And all that's required is that we train ourselves, that we lift up our eyes unto the hills from whence cometh our help, that we lift our eyes upward and look out over the fields and see them white to the harvest already. And this is the esoteric, the symbolic way of describing, sit in meditation, lift your eyes to the spiritual eye. There the light is waiting for us. It's literal. You look out with two eyes on a horizontal plane and you see all the ever-changing. You raise your eyes just above the horizon line, unite that duality in the spiritual eye, and the fields are white to harvest. Same fields, but seen from that point of view, filled with the divine light. That field is our own nature. Where we place our attention is who we are, and the choice is ours. Bless you.